Today's video is by request. In today's video, we're going to take a look at how to control the acquisition and the time and frequency domain analysis in a real-time spectrum analyzer. The test signal we're using is a low-duty cycle FSK transmission coming from a cordless telephone that is located just a few feet from the antenna on my spectrum analyzer. The key to controlling the acquisition and analysis in the real-time spectrum analyzer is understanding how to use the time overview display. So we'll add that one to the mix, along with another display that has a time domain axis, like frequency versus time. The time overview display has several key features in it that will allow you to control how much time we want to acquire and what portion of that acquisition we want to analyze. Now because this signal is low duty cycle and bursty, I'm going to turn on a simple power trigger at oh, about uh, minus 55 dBm or so to ensure that we're capturing data when that, tr that transmitter is turned on. The time overview display shows us RF amplitude versus time over whatever we've got set up for the acquisition bandwidth. In this case, we're looking at a 10 megahertz span centered at 1.92 gigahertz, which is where this trans, uh, cordless telephone is transmitting. The time overview display has several features that allow us to control how much time we want to record and what portion we want to analyze. The colored bars at the top of the display tell us a couple of things. The red bar is called the uh, spectrum time, and that's where the spectrum measurement that's being shown down here is being measured. So we can see that spectrum time is centered right over the rising edge of this RF burst. The blue bar is our analysis region. And uh, for any time domain analysis, it's going to show us over what period of time we're making that analysis. Each of these regions can be controlled by selecting the region uh, from the drop-down box here and adjusting the offset or the length. The offset tells us where that region begins with respect to the trigger, which we can see down here with the little red T. And the length simply tells us how long that bar is. We can actually adjust that by uh, typing in new numbers in this area here, or by simply mousing over the edges of the curtains. And if we grab, click and drag this edge here, we're essentially dragging the length and if I click and drag on the left edge, it adjusts the offset value. So for example, if I wanted to get a 200 microsecond long acquisition, I could just type in 200U. Now I've got a 200 microsecond long acquisition here. And if I want to have a little more pre-trigger information, I can simply click and drag that edge over and grab a little more pre-trigger information here if I wanted to do so. So now what this analysis region defines is for any display that we bring up, whether it's a modulation analysis, or in this case, a frequency deviation versus time, it shows us over what portion of our acquisition we're going to be making that measurement. In this case here, we're grabbing some data before the burst happens, and then encompassing the entire burst, and then after the burst is finished. And we can see in the frequency deviation versus time is that when that burst comes up, we can actually see the FSK, or uh, binary frequency shift keying modulation, that is contained in that burst. Of course, we can zoom in on that and actually get a better picture of what that uh, binary FSK uh, modulation looks like. If I right click and add a marker, those markers appear in every single display, and everything is time and frequency correlated. So if I move that marker back and forth in time in this frequency deviation versus time plot, I can also see it moving in the time overview display to show me where I am in that particular burst versus time. I'm going to right click and clear the markers just to make the displays a little bit, a little bit cleaner here. Now the spectrum time uh, works in a very similar way, but there is one more little bit of a twist. The offset certainly tells us where the spectrum measurement begins, but the spectrum length, you notice that the text for that right here is italicized. Italicized text in this application tells us that, tells us 
that that value is coupled to something or was set by something else. In this case, the spectrum length is actually driven by the resolution bandwidth that you asked for in the spectrum analysis. So if I change the resolution bandwidth, say to 50 kilohertz, notice that the spectrum length has grown. If I or increase the resolution bandwidth to say 200 kilohertz, notice that the spectrum length has decreased. And this is just driven by you know, the mathematics of doing the uh, discrete Fourier transform to compute the spectrum. So the next question might be, what happens if I manually make the spectrum length longer? Let's go drag that longer across this entire burst. Let's talk about what happens. Now obviously the longer spectrum length would allow me to have a narrower resolution bandwidth, but I still have 100 kRBW. So what happens when I make the spectrum length longer is it will, will compute multiple spectrums. You know, in this case we had about a 22 microsecond long spectrum length, so what it will do is compute multiple discrete Fourier transforms and give me you know, a number of spectrum results. And what it does then is pa pass each of those spectrum trace results through whatever trace detector we have selected. In this case, we have a positive peak trace detector. So we're going to take those multiple spectrums that were computed across this acquisition, pass each of them through that positive peak detect, and this shows me now the positive peak detect result uh, of those multiple spectrum traces that were computed across that acquisition. You can kind of see this, that the, the noise floor here is now kind of more of a peak detected noise floor. If I return the spectrum length back to the auto-coupled value, I can do that by selecting it, hitting the backspace key to delete, and hit enter. And when I do that, take a look at how the noise floor looks in the spectrum. You can see now that I've got a little bit more variation in the noise floor because this is just one computation that's occurring now and not a peak detected version of multiple spectrum computations. Of course, we can move the spectrum anywhere we want in the acquisition, and we can see at this point within the burst, that's what the spectrum looked like. If I move further along in the burst, you can see the spectrum has a different shape to it, and that's all because the modulation is changing throughout that burst. So we're going to get a change in what the spectrum of the signal looks like throughout that burst. Of course, another way to look at the spectral changes over time is to bring up a display called a spectrogram or waterfall display. Uh, this display uh, really combines looking at both time domain and frequency domain at the same time. Now I'm going to pause things here so uh, we can talk about what's happening. Now in the spectrogram we see these tick marks over here on the right hand side. Those tick marks are indications that I've got a, a break in time. And what that really is showing us is that I've got multiple acquisitions in memory. You see the blue bar right down here? That corresponds to the most rec recent acquisition that's indicated by this blue bar here. All of the other uh, you know, spectrums that we see in this waterfall display are actually from prior acquisitions. This waterfall display essentially has the same x-axis as the spectrum analyzer, same center frequency and span, but the vertical axis is time. And we can actually see this time per division value up here. That time per division value refers to the time between the tick marks on the left side of this display. And we can actually reduce that to kind of stretch out what we're seeing in the spectrogram. So now I can see just a, the first couple of acquisitions here, the most recent one we're looking at, and the one before that, and the one before that. Each row of pixels in the spectrogram is essentially a spectrum trace. In fact, if we add a marker in here, wherever that marker appears, uh, we can yank that particular spectrum trace out of this display and show it to you down here, in this case, as a red trace. If I drag that marker through in time, we can actually see how the spectrum changes over time. And again, you see that that marker correlated in all of the other displays. So at the very beginning of the burst, where we have this very fast FSK, we can actually see the spectrum actually has a distinctly different shape. Uh, where if we drag that marker later in the burst, where the data is a bit more random, the spectrum shape is a bit more rounded off. So now you can actually see the spectral shape versus the modulation versus the amplitude versus time, all in the same set of displays. 
Uh, when I reduced the time per division uh, on the spectrogram, what we effectively did is, is change the amount of overlap of the consecutive discrete Fourier transforms that were taken to build up this waterfall or spectrogram display. So rather than incrementing over 22 microseconds and 22 microseconds and 22 microseconds to get multiple spectrums, we're overlapping those. And the amount we're overlapping is indicated right up here. In this case, 91%. So what that means is I'm, I compute a spectrum here, that goes into the spectrogram, then I'm only moving over about 9% and doing it again. So I'm getting kind of a sliding FFT to build up these spectrums over time. Now the spectrogram is a bit unique because it not only uses the spectrum length, because it shows you what the spectrum length is for each of the spectrums computed here, but also uses the analysis time to show me over what period of time we're going to compute those multiple spectrums. So the marker here is, is active in both displays. So if I move the marker back and forth in frequency, we can see it moving back and forth in frequency on the spectrum displays like the DPX and spectrum displays on the lower right hand corner. And if I move it up and down in time, we can see that moving in the time domain axes. Now the time overview display also allows you to link both the analysis and spectrum length together into just one control. I generally don't use that because I like to know what my spectrum length is and how many spectrums are being computed. But you certainly could uh, link those together and have everything kind of controlled just by one set of offset and length controls. So I hope this video helped you to understand a little bit better on how to use the time overview display to control how much time we want to acquire, what portion of that we want to analyze in the time domain and the frequency domain, and how all of those things relate to the other displays that we can bring up in the real-time spectrum analyzer display. Thanks again for watching. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please do so. And thanks again for watching.